I always found in the Canadian wild a kind of a sanctuary. And even as I went to university in the States and became immersed in the tumultuous years of the late 60s and early 70s, but oddly enough, it was only when I studied botany after a long period in the Amazon that I really came to understand the, the wonder of biology. And one of the things I often think about is how close I came to never studying biology, which is incredible. You know, you think about it, Rhett, you would never send a kid through university uh, and allow them to graduate if they couldn't tell a photograph from a painting or a, um, a, 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 you know, a, a work of prose from poetry. And yet we graduate people all the time who don't know the fundamental formula of life, which is photosynthesis. You know, the, the simple idea that photons of light can spark a reaction between water and carbon dioxide to give us our food, carbohydrates, and the very air that we breathe. Welcome to Maga Bay Sessions. I'm your host, Maga Bay founder, Rep Butler. In this series, we'll be interviewing some of the world's leading conservation thinkers and doers about their experiences and what can be done to make the world a better place. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy. Here with Wade Davis, uh, the famed author, um, ethnobotanist, uh, among many other things. Um, welcome, Wade. It's a pleasure to, to connect with you. Well, nice to have me. Thanks a lot, Rhett. What inspired your interest in nature and indigenous peoples? Well, I think my interest in nature um, was almost within me as a Canadian. You know, the, the way to the north kind of hovers in our imagination and defines the essence of the national soul. I mean, the purest expression of, of patriotism in Canada is a line of francophone verse from the inimitable Julien Vigneault who said, mon pays n'est pas un pays, c'est l'hiver. My country is not a country, it's the winter. And I certainly grew up in Montreal, although I was born in British Columbia, on the banks of the St. Lawrence River, which of course was the artery by which the um, the, 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 the original Cour de Bois, the runners of the woods, the fur traders, broke open a continent. And one of the things that's difficult sometimes for Americans to appreciate is that Canada was not a settler society. You know, we didn't, we didn't come here as settlers. We came here as merchants. And the, the, the driving factor, of course, was a fashion statement in Europe, the beaver hat. And so it was a pursuit of furs, which really determined both the economy and the initial settling of the country. And in that sense, we, we, we not only didn't set out to deliberately slaughter indigenous people, as John Ralston saw, one of our greater writers um, put it, we married them. And in doing so, we moved up in the world. That isn't to suggest that the colonial experience for First Nations in Canada was always a happy one, quite to the contrary. But the nation was, was forged with this idea of the wild, of the bush. And I was able to be part of that in my generation, whether it was at the age of 11 on canoe trips in Northern Quebec, or later when I returned to British Columbia, and uh, from the age of 15 was fighting forest fires, you know, soon uh, working as a guide, uh, uh, both a hunting guide and a whitewater guide, and eventually, you know, a park ranger for many years and so on. So I, I, I always found in the Canadian wild, a kind of a sanctuary. And even as I went to university in the States and became immersed in the tumultuous years of the late 60s and early 70s, um, I always would return to the Canadian Rockies or to the north. And, and uh, I always found solace there. So in that sense, I, I love nature in the abstract, in the experiential sense from the youngest age. But oddly enough, it was only when I studied botany after a long period in the Amazon that I really came to understand the, the wonder of biology. And one of the things I often think about is how close I came to never studying biology, which is incredible. You know, you think about it, Rhett, you would never send a kid through university uh, and allow them to graduate if they couldn't tell a photograph from a painting or a um, uh, 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 you know, a, a work of prose from poetry. And yet we graduate people all the time who don't know the fundamental formula of life, which is photosynthesis. You know, the, the simple idea that photons of light can spark a reaction between water and carbon dioxide to give us our food, carbohydrates, and the very air that we breathe, oxygen. I mean, I've always maintained that nobody should have the right to run for office if they haven't A, served in the military, and B, um, is capable of reciting that formula. I mean, that's 
that would be a good rule <laughs> to have. Um, that that interest in the wild, uh, coming out of your youth, um, I guess led you on quite an adventure um, in 1974 when you crossed the uh, Darien Gap uh, in Panama and Colombia on foot, which has got to be one of the wildest places on earth. And I'm curious as to what impressions did that uh, journey make on you and you know, influence your later? Well, that, it actually turned out to be uh, an incredibly uh, important um, passage in my life. I, I, had, I had sort of gone off to South America in a serendipitous way, which is the way I sort of did everything. I mean, I think one of the lessons for young people is that they look up at someone of my age now, 66, and they see the books that I've written, the films that I've made, the adventures I've had, the recognition and even accolades I've received. Uh, and and they, and they think, well, how can I do that? You know, well, the answer is you're gonna do it. You know, the reason I've done all that is because I'm 66 years old. So it's all one step at a time. And my life had no plan whatsoever. No one was more confused coming out of college than I was. You know, I I ended up going to Harvard because I used to fight forest fires, and our camps were full of draft dodgers. And one of them had the Life magazine with the Harvard student strike on the cover of 1960 nine and i thought well that's got to be the school you go to become cool like these guys and so i applied not even knowing where it was and i got in and then my family didn't have the money to come to boston so i flew down there as a 17 year old with a big steamer trunk got to logan airport didn't know where harvard was i saw this black guy with a harvard t-shirt i thought he's got to know he didn't know either and so i my family didn't take taxis so i dragged my trunk to the subway came up and Harvard Square. And then I, in this madness of the era uh, of, you know, Harry Krishna over here and STS over here and people on high on acid over there, I um, realized my mom had made a mistake and the dorms weren't open for another week. And so I had nowhere to go, no money in my pocket. And I dragged my trunk in, through Cambridge until I found a church and I knocked on the door and a pastor welcomed me and put me up for a week. And that's when I fell in love with the United States. But he was a big war resistor and his basement was full of kids escaping to Canada. So I became radicalized and I spent most of my first year making the last um, upheaval at Harvard, organizing the last university wide student strike. And uh, then it came time where I had to declare a major and I hadn't even thought about it. And the next day was a deadline and I came out by chance from the Museum of Ethnology and I, and with my head still swirling with these images, of, of shaman and, and, and uh, indigenous people, uh, I ran into a friend. I said, Stuart, what are you going to major? And he said, anthropology. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, you read about Indians. And I thought like Forrest Gump, that'll do. So I signed on as a student of anthropology. And then two years later, having grown tired of just reading about indigenous people, my roommate and I were in a cafe in Harvard Square dreaming of traveling to live with indigenous people. And David, there was a map, of, a National Geographic map right beside us on the wall. And David suddenly looked at the map and he looked at me and he pointed to the Arctic. Well, I had to go somewhere. And I watched my left arm lift and it hit the Northwest Amazon of Columbia. And if it had landed in Rome, I might've become a Renaissance scholar. But having decided to go to the Amazon, there was only one man to see this legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evans Schultes. And I knocked on his door the door of a man for whom mountains had been named in South America, uh, the greatest uh, uh, Amazonian botanical explorer, the man who sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. And I just said, I've saved up money in a logging camp. I'm from British Columbia. I want to go to the Amazon and collect plants like you did. And uh, he looked across a mound of plant specimens and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon with no plans whatsoever, a one-way ticket, small backpack of clothes, and two books, Lawrence's Taxonomy of Vascular Plants, which I intended to study, and um, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which would be my, my kind of anchor through all those months of wandering. So that's really how life unfolds, not in a linear sense, but in a serendipitous sense. And what you want to do as a young person is cultivate a kind of inner compass. So when you come to those opportunities or they come to you, you're ready to take them. You leap off the cliff. It's like Jim Whitaker said, the first American to climb Everest. If you're not living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. And you, you want to sort of be an opportunist, not like a schemer, but put yourself in the way of, uh, of moments where there's no choice but success. And you suddenly find yourself 
capable of doing things that would have been unimaginable a few months before. And so back to your question about the Darien Gap, I was just back from the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, where with my colleague Tim Plowman, my sort of pro mentor and, 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 and Schult Schulte's protege, uh, we had had a botanical expedition. He was going back to Boston uh, to get his PhD. <clears throat> and I had a month of, on my hands and I ran into a geographer who told me there was this Englishman who was looking for someone to guide him through the Darien Gap and if I was interested in going. And I said, sure, having no idea where it was and no idea that it would consume six to seven weeks of my life and, and uh, give, give one misadventure after another. Uh, and at that time, the gap was much wider than it is today. It was a gap between um, Colombia and Panama, where they had not built the Pan American Highway. And uh, it was sort of, you, to give you an idea of its reputation, on, on the night before we entered the, uh, the swamps, because his journalists had a deal where he had to walk all the way from Tierra del Fuego to Alaska, and he had reached Colombia, so he couldn't take any form of even aquatic transport, not even a canoe. So we had to first walk through the Cienega, the wetlands of the of the Atrato, with water up to our necks uh, in the rainy season. Uh, you know, uh, just to get to the river, to get into position to begin the ascent into the Darien. And uh, the night before we entered the the water, the swamps, uh, a little old lady came up to me in this massive thunderstorm and said. Uh, Granito, your hair is brown and your eyes are blue. It's too bad everything will be yellow by the time you get to Panama. And the truth is we, we did have a, a kind of a misadventure. Uh, Sebastian Snow was, was a, kind of a, a kind of eccentric Englishman who, who sort of said, if you speak the Queen's language loud enough, anyone will understand. And he kind of courted misadventure as fodder for his books and his genre was sort of the Englishman out of his element. And so we kind of stumbled our way across the Darien uh, with misadventures from, you know, encounters with, with uh, dubious characters to, to being chased by the police, to being set up to be killed, encounters with jaguars. Eventually we were lost three days with no food or shelter for 10, uh, for, uh, eventually for, we were lost for about 10 days uh, with three Kuna uh, indigenous people, men, uh, who are equally lost and you know when you're lost it's not the the length of the period it's a sheer uncertainty that consumes every moment so it was kind of this sort of crazy wild <clears throat> experience but you know it 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 was really uh terrific for me because sebastian wrote a book about his adventure he eventually went mad and was shipped back home from costa rica uh, when he got up in the middle of the night in a hospital and put on his pajamas and started to walk north uh, uh, but he wrote a book about it, which was a, a, a kind of a, a, a silly book, uh, ignored at the time and long forgotten. But it was the first time my writing ever appeared in print because uh, he had lifted passages from my journal, which seemed like a fair exchange because it gave him some content and allowed to see my words alongside his. And it, and it gave me a great inspiration that if, if this kind of endearing but crazy Englishman can write books, I can too, only my books will not be uh, typed. They're gonna be written and they're not gonna be with that focused on self, but on the worlds around me, you know, based on thorough research. And so that's when I really got the idea that I too could become a writer. So in a way that was Sebastian's great, great gift to me. I mean, that, that's quite a story. Um, um, I mean, since then, you've become an incredibly prolific writer in terms of I mean, everything from books to, um, to articles and, and uh, you know, writing for films. Um, you have a new book out which talks about Columbia's Great River. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, I mean, w w eventually I, I wrote a book called One River which was in part an account of the travels that I did in South America with Tim Plowman, um, mainly studying coca, the, the, the divine leaf of immortality and the notorious source of cocaine. And um, uh, it was also a biography of Professor Schultes. And it was published in Spanish in 2002, translated by a wonderful Colombian poet, Nicholas Sesquan. And at a time when, uh, Columbia's very ability to endure as a nation was in question. A book of botany and plant exploration uh, with a print run in Spanish of maybe 500 copies ought not to have registered. But 
the strength of the book was the quality of the translation and the fact that it 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 it, it ran to 700 pages in Spanish uh, without a single reference to the conflict. It told the story of Colombia that was a story in dark in defiance of the dark cliches. And especially for two generations of young people, it kind of emerged almost like a map of dreams, you know, um, an account of travel in their own country that was no longer available to them because of the, the violence. And so it really affected young people. And by word of mouth, it kind of grew and became in, in, in a sort of a cult book. And recently when the National Library selected the first 25 of the 200 most important books in the history of Columbia, it was selected as amongst one of the 25. And it really had that kind of impression on the, the impact on the country. And, and that set in motion a, a series of events that drew me back to Columbia after a long hiatus, uh, including three films that I made and any number of presentations and eventually culminating in my becoming uh, an honorary Colombian citizen, thanks to the generosity of um, ex-presidente Juan Manuel Santos, a Nobel laureate. But one of the opportunities created by One River is that the head of one of Colombia's largest corporate citizens, Grupo Argos, had read it and decided to support some friends of mine who were going to produce books of photography and natural history on each of the five major regions of Colombia. Now, of course, one of the messages of this project was that there, this was not a land of violence. Um, it was a land of the richest biodiversity, ecological and geographical diversity on earth, which it is. And, and the idea was to send a message to two generations of Colombian kids that this is what their country really was. And out of that came um, a whim uh, conceived at, over a drink at lunch uh, where I said, now that we've done the land, why don't we do the rivers? And in a heartbeat, they endorsed the project. And I had no idea that that serendipitous moment would result in five years of engagement telling the story of the Mississippi of Columbia, the main artery of life, a corridor of commerce, but also the fountain of culture, of, of poetry, prayer, uh, literature, and music. Um, and it, it became a, a way of doing, in a sense, a biography of the nation, because Mag the Magdalena did not only make this incredible mountainous country possible, um, Columbia itself is the gift of the river. <clears throat> and, and it allowed me to tell the story of Columbia uh, in, its, in its totality, you know. And one of the obvious messages of the book is to remind people that um, yes, there have been 220,000 dead. Yes, there have been 7 million displaced by the conflict, but the conflict would not have endured a single week had it not been for the fuel of the fire of war, which was money from cocaine. And in that sense, um, you know, uh, everybody is complicitous. I mean, everybody who's ever used cocaine and every government that's facilitated the black market trade while prohibiting the drug with doing nothing to actually limit its circulation distribution, everybody has the blood of Colombians on their hands. And how would, how would you know, uh, um, Americans feel if, ca if Canada, for example, had patterns of drug consumption in our bars and boardrooms across the country? And, and laws that facilitated a black market trade and, and yet regulations and oversight that did nothing to prevent that trade effectively, such that 85 million Americans would be forced to flee their homes. Well, that's what happened in Colombia. And the extraordinary thing is during all the years of violence, um, there were never more than 200, maybe 300,000 combatants in a, in a country of 50 million people. So the vast majority of Colombians were innocent victims of a war that, as I say, was made possible only by the proceeds of the cocaine trade. In the last year before the peace agreement was signed in 2016, the FARC, the major leftist group of guerrillas, was down to maybe 6,000 cadre, mostly teenagers in search of a meal. And yet in that last year of war, FARC made over $600 million US uh, from extortion and drug trafficking, much of it from cocaine. Well, as I often say, if you give me $600 million in the Boy Scouts of any major American city, I can wreak havoc in any American state. So the amazing thing is that despite this kind of imposed war caused by our 
a, a, a gluttonous passion for this drug, which is so horrible, a drug best used by dentists to facilitate the pulling of a tooth, um, the Colombians have nevertheless maintained civil society and democracy, greened their cities, created millions of acres of national parks, and sought restitution with indigenous people in a way that no nation state can match and paved the way for a kind of economic renaissance as two generations of young Colombians forced to flee the country because of the violence are now coming home. And they're coming home from every capital in the world with skill sets in every endeavor. So Colombia, you know, if peace will endure, uh, has an incredible future in front of it. And, and I do believe as one who truly loves Colombia and is now a Colombian citizen, that in some sense we owe something to Colombia. And of course, what the book Magdalena attempts to do is reveal in a sense the full beauty and glory of, of the, the country. And I think the best um, endorsement the book has had uh, comes from my friend Hector Abad, who is a great a Colombian journalist, wonderful writer, uh, one of the great writers of nonfiction and fiction in Latin America. And Hector uh, has, has been famously bitter about his own nation ever since his father was assassinated. And the death of his father was one of a handful of killings that in a bloodstained nation really shook the whole country. And it made him very ambivalent about his country. He's famously known to have a sort of love-hate thing with this country. He was forced into exile in Italy and so on. And Hector read the book and said, only Wade could make me love my country again. And that's really what Magdalena is. It's truly a love letter to Colombia. That's, I mean, there's so many places to go from, from that. I mean, it's, it's just really remarkable. Um, so I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, and you mentioned in your, in what Columbia has done to recognize the rights of and protect the, the lands belonging to indigenous peoples. But um, so indigenous peoples have been central to much of your work. And one of the things you've written about is the loss of culture and language. Um, I'd love to get your take on why the loss of a single language or, I mean, even like extending it to a species is, is so important. And, well, so, you know, the, the biological analogy is apropos. I mean, you know, uh, extinction is a natural phenomena, but in general, over the last 600 million years, speciation, the generation of new forms of life has outpaced extinction, making for a more, more diverse world. By the same token, languages have come and gone through history. We don't speak Latin anymore in the streets of Rome. But before Latin faded away, it had in time to leave its descendants, the, the, the 12 Romance languages. Now, languages like species are disappearing at, at, at a rate that they have no time, if you will, to leave descendants. You know, one of the most haunting statistics is that of the 7,000 languages spoken the day that I was born, fully half today are not being taught to children. And, and a language, as I've written, uh, you know, is not just a vocabulary and grammar. It's a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of a culture comes in the material world. Every language I once uh, wrote is an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And to lose a language is to lose a branch of the family tree. Um, and, and, and the glory and the power and the, and the beauty and, and the contents of a language has nothing to do with the number of speakers um, who use that language. You know, the, 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 you know, every language, like every culture, deserves to be heard. I mean, this is a great lesson of anthropology. And, in, you know, that every, you know, the purpose of anthropology, is, as Ruth Benedict says, is to make the world safe for human differences. You know, it's not like I, I'm not interested in being a spokesperson for indigenous people. They're per fully capable of speaking more powerfully than I could possibly do on their own behalf. I'm just a human being um, asking us what kind of world we want to live in, a, a monochromatic world of monotony or a truly pluralistic multicultural world of diversity where we recognize that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being us, let alone failed attempts at being modern. You know, every culture is by definition an answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 languages of humanity. 
And every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just like none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. And of course, the reason this is so important is that we have all, as humans, been famously culturally myopic from the dawn of consciousness. You know, most indigenous societies, the name for themselves translates to the people, the implication being the blokes over the hill or savages. And that kind of um, myopia, which we all indulge, is no longer possible or, or tolerable in, in a multicultural uh, world. And, and, and we, we, this, this idea that, that, you know, our world is the real world and everybody else has a failed attempt to mean us is something that humans tend to share. And so we in the West tend to think of, you know, this technological industrial world of ours um, as being the norm and everybody else is a failure to be us, you know, but the truth is that the triumph of secular materialism may be the conceit of modernity, but it doesn't suggest in its ubiquity or dominance that it's the norm. It's not. It's the anomaly. You know, we have an extractive model that is derived in a very direct way from the Enlightenment. When Descartes famously said that all that exists is mind and matter, he deanimated the world. And in our quest to free ourselves from the burden of absolute faith, we threw out all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, but critically, metaphor. And so the idea that the flight of a bird could have meaning, that a mountain could be a deity, that, that a forest was the abode of spirits, was dismissed as ridiculous. But in fact, those re relationships based on metaphor have defined the human footprint on the earth for a very long time. Most societies engage in natural world, the ethnographic record makes abundantly clear, through not an extractive perspective, but through the notion of reciprocity. The simple idea that the earth owes its bounty to humans and humans in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And the purpose of the point of metaphor is the consequences of the belief, not the absolute veracity or, or falsehood that the belief might, to your perspective, represent. So that if I believe that a mountain is an apu deity that will direct my destiny, I'm going to have a very different relationship to it than if I believe it's a pile of inert rock ready to be mined. If I believe that a forest is just cellulose and bored feet, I'm going to have a different attitude towards it than if I believe, as the Kwakwakwak do, that it's the abode of Hukuk and, uh, um, uh, 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 and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits that dwell at the north end of the world. Again, it's not who's right and who's wrong. It's how the belief system mediates the relationship between the human population and the natural environment with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint. I mean, one of the things we can draw inspiration from these different visions of life that the cultures of the world represent is that our way is not the only way. And those of us who say, for example, in terms of climate change, that we cannot change as we all we know we must change the fundamental way we inhabit this planet are simply wrong. There are options, there are, are alternatives, and we have to move toward, towards them expeditiously, given the situation we've created over just 300 years in which the industrial processes have been consuming the ancient sunlight of the world in this carbon economy. So in, in, in that sense, you know, the, the anthropology, you know, anthropology is so important. Uh, and it's been unfortunately kind of divorced itself from the activism from which it emerged. I mean, one of the things that people uh, don't really think about much, but if you if you look, for example, Rhett, your great grandfather, or your great great grandfather, you know, in, in 1900, um, the, the the belief structures that he would have had about the role of women, the role of men, notions of race, um, attitudes of ascendancy over nature, whatever go down the line, probably not one of those certitudes you would agree with today. Um, and the question is, wh where did we get from that way of thinking to how we think today? Well, we can cite the social movements that have brought women from the kitchen to the boardroom, from gay people from the closet to the altar, people of color from the woodshed to the White House. But those social movements had to have a foundation. They had to have some catalyst that challenged the orthodoxies of that previous Edwardian era. And that challenge was done by a small group of contrarians that called themselves anthropologists that gathered around the great 
scholar, Franz Boas, who is as important to the birth of modernity as we know it, as Einstein or Freud or, or Darwin. And because these, these anthropologists, based on their experience, said the obvious, that race was a total fiction, a total cultural construct that had no foundation in biology whatsoever, which has been completely confirmed by genetic analysis that shows that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth. The genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is an utter fiction, a social construct. These were anthropologists who said a family didn't have to be just a man and a woman. It could be a man and two women. It could be a woman and two men. It could be two men, whatever may brought love to the hearth. This is a family, you know, uh, 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 individuals who, who um, you know, who, who, uh, 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 recognize that the, that the other people's world weren't failed attempts at being modern, uh, that every culture was a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? Um, and and, uh, uh, and when the peoples of the world answered that question, they did so w with all the voices of humanity. Th that Those ideas were so shattering to the European mind. Remember that as late as 1911, and that would be, you know, four, five years before my own father was born. The English Oxford Dictionary did not have an entry for racism because the superiority of the white male was accepted with such assurance. It didn't have an entry for colonialism. You know, it didn't have an entry for homosexuality. In other words, that shattering of the... So when I say to a young person like you, Red, that if you think it's quite normal that a black girl would fall in love with a white boy or that a Jewish girl or, or boy would find solace in the Buddhist Dharma, or that a young African-American um, uh, woman would look up and say, those aren't the statues to the Confederacy. I am the statue of the Confederacy because look at the hue of my skin. This tells you that my African ancestor was raped by an overseer. I am the statue of the Confederacy, deal with it. If you understand what she meant, then you are truly a child of anthropology. It is anthropology that sowed the seeds of modernity by challenging those orthodoxies, which we now see as not only false, but morally um, uh, 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 reprehensible. Uh, so covered so much there. I mean, um, I think just following up on, on one of the latter things you said, um, so you've talked about the role that anthropology plays in, in a wide range of, of, of areas. Um, what are the things you think that the conservation movement can learn from anthropology in order to be more effective, more inclusive? And well, I think, I think that, you know, it, one of the things that, that is so interesting is, is, you know, there used to be this chasm between the naturalists and the anthropologists where, you know, the naturalists tended to see people, indigenous people in particular, as part of the problem and anthropologists couldn't abide the misanthropic elitism of the naturalists. Um, a, a classic example of that uh, occurred in 1979 when I was a student at Harvard in graduate school and the Dalai Lama stopped to speak at Harvard as his last event on his first North American tour. And that night, Ed Wilson, the legendary biologist, and wonderful man, was introducing in one hall Norman Myers, who had written a book called The Sinking Ark, which was one of the first books to anticipate the biodiversity crisis. And across the way, literally a kitty corner, was His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. And naturally, all the students and faculty were lined up to see His Holiness. And in apologizing to Norman Myers for the sparse audience in his hall, Ed Wilson, as kind and decent and wonderful a man as you as ever walked the earth, he, I, I know him well and I revere him. Um, but nevertheless, and he'd be the first to regret these words, but they are emblematic of that era. In apologizing to Myers, he said, and I quote, if even Harvard students can't get their priorities right and they'd rather be across the way listening to that religious kook, you know how far we've got to go to educate the public at large. But that statement was so indicative of this chasm. And I, I swear to God, I must have been the only student that night running back and forth between the two talks because I recognized then what we now know to be obvious, which is the same forces that impact and erode cultural diversity are destroying biological diversity. Um, the triumph of ideology, um, industrial intrusions and egregious public policies. 
And so, and so now, of course, the amazing thing is that genetics, as I said earlier, uh, has come to the fore to actually prove what was only an intuition of anthropology, this idea that, um, you know, every culture is a product of its own history. You know, in other words, if we, if we accept the fact that it is now scientifically indisputable that the genetic endowment is a continuum, we're all descendants of that same handful of people who walked out of Africa 65,000 years ago and then in 40,000 years settled every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important thing. If we are cut from the same genetic cloth, we share the same raw intellectual capacity by definition across the board. And whether that genius is invested in technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement in the West, or placed, for example, into the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. The old Victorian idea that persists to this day, that we somehow went from the primitive to the civilized, from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London, where we, where we use technology alone as the value of a culture and you know suggesting that there's a sort of evolutionary development rising to ourselves at the top of a pyramid that slopes down to the so-called primitives of the world that idea persists in an incredibly stubborn way but is completely false the truth is that that how we use this genius is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation so to go for example into the australian outback when the british first washed ashore in australia they saw people that looked strange, had a simple material technology, but what offended the British is the Aboriginal people had no interest in personal improvement of their material lot. They had no concept of progression through time. And, and since those ideas were the essence of Victorian thought during that era, the British in their inimitable way concluded the Aboriginals were not humans at all, and they began to shoot them. As recently as 1902, again, this is, you know, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not, right? Um, and, and in fact, what was going on in Australia was an entire civilization, 10,000 clan territories linked together by a single subtle devotional philosophy, which we called the dreaming. But it wasn't a dream. It was a conviction that the world at your feet both exists and yet is always waiting to be born. Not in one of the 670 dialects and languages of, of that parsimonious continent of Australia was there a word for time, for past, present, or future. There was only the unfolding of creation, the dreaming. And the entire culture and civilization was based not on the notion of progress, but the antithesis of that, stasis. The purpose of life wasn't to change anything. On the contrary, it was to do the ritual gestures along the song lines, which were the trajectories walked at the dawn of time by the ancestral beings as they sang the universe into existence. To do the rituals along the song line that traverses your clan territory with the intention of keeping the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It would be as if all of European intellectual life had been focused on pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. But again, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. Had we followed that human devotional instinct, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. We wouldn't have developed allopathic medicine. We wouldn't have the internet, all these glorious things. On the other hand, we also wouldn't have climate change and our capacity to transform the biophysical foundations of life on Earth. So 50,000 years hence, you can ask the question, which adaptive strategy will have been seen as to have been in the long term, the most sustainable um, of the two? So again, this isn't to suggest that we go back to a pre-industrial past or that any people in the world be kept from the genius of modernity. It's rather to say, you know, how do we find a way that all peoples can benefit from the genius of modernity without that engagement demanding the death of who they are as a people? Uh, because culture is not trivial. It's, it's a body of moral and ethical values that keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all human beings. You know, it's, it's culture that allows us to look, as Lincoln said, for the better angels of our nature. You know, there's a reason that, that a nation that gave us Goethe 
and, and, and von Humboldt uh, also gave us Hitler and, and Goring and Goebbels, right? Uh, it, it's not like the Germans were uniquely capable of a descent into barbarism, but they did go into a barbaric state that brought death to millions. You know, the, I'm not comparing the situation in the United States to Nazi Germany, but we do have a situation where we're seeing a vast cohort of the American population prepared to uh, embrace the reprehensible and, and uh, 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 morally repugnant uh, positions and, 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 characterize, and character of a buffoon, of a, of a, of a, a president, a, a bone spur president um, of, of, of incredibly um, um, a corrupt essence, right? And yet we have, we have 60 million Americans who would d fall on their sword for this guy. So what is that, what's that saying about what's become of America? You know, so, you know, you know, you know, it, you, know I, you look around the world and human beings are one step away from barbarism. I mean, they really are. If you, if you look what happened in the killing fields in, 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 uh, in, in Cambodia, you know, the, the, the genocide in Rwanda, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, the, 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 the crisis of, of, of Nazi Germany, the, 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 the events in the Soviet Union in the wake of the revolution. Um, you know, I mean, you, 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 human beings are truly capable of descent into barbarism and, and the struggle, and that's what culture is. I mean, culture is, is designed as a moral uh, and ethical blanket that at least attempts to mitigate against that human propensity. So to follow up on the current situation, um, you wrote a, a piece in Rolling Stone recently that we're witnessing the end of the American era. And well, I, still, I'd like your take on that. Second of all, do you think uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is going to drive change in how people think about our relationship with each other and, and nature? Well, you know, COVID, the piece I wrote for Rolling Stone, uh, you know, in, in, it's almost a story within the story because, you know, I wrote that piece on spec, sent it to my friend Jan Wenner. He, we got it edited and it ran. Nobody expected it to go viral, but I mean, it's had 362 million social media impressions. It, it trended on the site for five weeks. It had 5 million views on rollingstone.com. And it spoke to a kind of a hunger and need. And uh, 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 COVID itself uh, w will have any number of impacts. I mean, the positive uh, impact one would hope is that the world woke up to realize how interconnected we are, that we really are living beings on a biological planet, you know, a, a form of life 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt literally commandeered the mechanisms of our cells and caused us to produce it, not us. Um, uh, it also attacked the network of connectivity and community uh, that is for a social species like humans, um, what teeth and claws represent to the tiger, you know? So at the same time, uh, as we saw our vulnerability, we also saw the incredible resilience and recuperative powers of the earth. I mean, those images of the Himalaya shining at last over the cities of the subcontinent from Karachi to Kathmandu to Delhi, uh, the, the canals of Venice clear, the rivers of cities in Colombia running like trout streams through Medellin, um, the re-inhabitation of the cities by wild creatures, the wild boar in Barcelona, Caiman blanketing, blanketing the beaches of Baja, flamingos in the wetlands of Mumbai. We saw this amazing resilience of the earth. And it's, it's humbling to remember, Rhett, that if you took the entire history of our species, our hominid lineage, I don't just mean Homo sapiens, or progenitor Homo erectus, I mean going right back to Homo afarensis 3.5 million years ago, that entire lineage. And if you were to con condense that um, with the Earth's life being a 24 hour clock, our entire presence as a lineage of hominids um, would not occupy one second of the 24 hours. So our presence is by definition fleeting. The Earth will win in the end. Uh, but will what will become of human beings is, is I guess, another question. Um, 
but the, but but certain impacts of COVID, you know, whether it's the you know or sociologically, you can only imagine will be positive. I mean, people are waking up to the fact that they're spending four hours hours a day commuting to to um, uh, middle uh, to to white collar jobs that could readily be done from home. The grotesque inefficiencies of that. You know, managers are waking up to realize that they were paying $10,000 a year so that one employee could have a 120 square foot cubicle in some midtown building in Manhattan. Um, people are realizing that, that you know, um, uh, it'll be a long time, I think, before people, and, and, and they'll be long after it's biologically safe, people will still be hesitant to go into dark movie theaters, have the doors slammed shut, to sit shoulder by shoulder by wheezing and coughing uh, strangers to watch a movie that can be readily streamed into the home as all entertainment can be. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're gonna go back to sporting events to, as soon as we can, but, but the key thing about all those sorts of uh, impacts is that they're, 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 they're things we're gonna readily adapt to. You know, we're incredibly um, adaptive species. I mean, the fluidity of our memory our capacity to forget is, is the most kind of haunting trait of our species. It accounts for why we're able to adapt to almost any degree of, um, of uh, environmental or, 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 or moral degradation. But where the COVID really opened up a vista onto a, a true um, development that was underway, but was perhaps less than clear to us, is what it revealed about the status of the American experiment. And this is why the article was called The Unraveling of America. You know, Americans woke up to realize that as 2,000 of them were dying a day, they were living in a, in a, in a failed state uh, led by a dysfunctional government at the helm of which was a buffoon who was advocating the use of disinfectants to treat uh, a, a serious pandemic, a disease that he did not have the intellectual capacity to understand. And, and what I tried to stress in that article is that if America, for example, on the eve of World War II was demilitarized and yet came into the war and through pure industrial production was able to literally, as Roosevelt promised, become the arsenal of democracy, spitting out liberty ships and, 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 jet, and, and, and fighter planes and B-24s by the hour, um, you know, um, equipping armies that marched across the world, not only the American armies, but the Russian armies. We sent half a million trucks to Russia, um, half a million Willis Jeeps. We sent a million miles of wiring. We sent 34 million uniforms and 18 million pairs of boots. I mean, this amazing industrial production of the United States that allowed, for example, for every five pounds of equipment that the Japanese Empire of the Sun got to a frontline troop per capita in the Pacific War, we got two tons. I mean, it's almost unbelievable the, the, the release of American power of industrial might during that war. That in the wake of the war, America is creating half the world's economy with much of the world in ashes. Um, and that affluence that we allowed us, for example, to produce 90% of the world's automobiles in 1947, uh, created, allowed for a level of wealth that created a treaty between, a truce between labor and capital that gave us a middle class, you know, gave us a, a world where a, a working man with limited education could own a home, buy a car, support a family, send his kids to good schools. And that, that, that treaty, that, that, that agreement was based on a uh, an economic model in the 50s that in a strange sense was more like Denmark than the America of today. You know, CEOs had 20 times the salary of, of uh, salaried employees, not four or 500 times. Um, you, you know, the, the marginal tax rates were 91%, not that people paid that much, but the message was there that we're all in this together. Well, today in America, as those same working men watched and women watched for two generations, as globalization eviscerated their factories, sending them off to shelve the groceries at Walmart. Uh, globalization trumped up uh, with iconic intensity when all it was, as they all knew, was just capital on the prowl in search of ever cheaper uh, sources of labor. And before you knew it, 1% of Americans controlled more wealth than the lower 1%. 
um, uh, 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 160, uh, whereas the lower 160 million uh, had more debt than wealth. Uh, uh, you know, three Americans, I'm sorry, the lo lower, lower half of the uh, uh, society, three Americans more wealth than the poorest 160 million. And, and you suddenly had this, this world of unfairness that, um, uh, uh, that, that, that was beginning to shatter the, the bonds of community. In the wake of World War II, we celebrated the individual with iconic intensity, um, allowing for mobility and freedom, but also bringing down in a sense of family. By the 1960s, half of marriages are ending in divorce. Only 6% of American homes have grandparents beneath the roof of grandchildren. We shunt off the elders to old age homes where they are left to slowly decay. We celebrate the workplace at the expense of family with slogans like 24 seven, implying total dedication to the workplace at the expense of family. And we wonder why the average American youth has spent by the age of 18, three full years passively watching a video monitor contributing to an obesity epidemic called by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a national security crisis. A country that thinks of itself as being well is consuming two thirds of the world's antipsychotic, antidepressant drugs. The leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50 has become opiate use and abuse. So the article is not anti-American, it's a love letter to America. It, it's like a family intervention. You're saying the first thing you do in an intervention is hold the mirror to the loved one to show how far they've fallen. And that's the first step on the path of rehabilitation, if you will. And, 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 and so, you know, the, 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 the America of today is not the America of its perception. So, for example, the country that celebrated freedom of information, uh, you know, Franklin, Monroe, Madison, Jefferson said schools are more important than Congress because if we don't have an educated electorate, we won't have uh, a, a, a meaningful democracy. And that's what I meant when I said that, you know, the, the Trump cohort voted their indignations. That's a sign of decadence because they weren't you know, thinking by definition of the nation, of the world, they were thinking just of themselves. When we build a, 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 a wall across the Mexican border, we're not only engaged in an act of folly, opening ourselves up to the ridicule of the world, proponents of that wall are engaged in an act of treason. Because treason isn't just giving state secrets to your enemy, it's when you indulge behavior that betrays the essence of who you are as a country. Now, it's true that immigrant groups have always had to crawl ashore in America. It's never been rosy for any of them. But the myth carved on the base of the Statue of Liberty is about the huddled masses. It's about the shining city on the hill. It's about the great hope. And that energy is the myth of America. And myths aren't old stories. Myths are moral charters. They're, they're, they're aspirational goals of a people. And so to put up a wall across the Mexican border is to deny the fundamental moral charter of the country. And that's why I claim it's an act, an act of treason. And when you compare, for example, Canada and America and the reaction to COVID, it's quite dramatic. On July 30th of this summer, the day that America announced close to 60,000 new cases of COVID here in Vancouver and British Columbia, uh, you know, again, a metropolitan city, concentrated in Asian city, dozens of flights coming in from China, two hours up the road from Seattle where the pandemic landed. While they announced 60,000 new cases, we had five cases in all of our hospitals. So what's going on here? We're no perfect place. Our healthcare system isn't perfect, but our healthcare system in a social democracy is focused on the collective, not the individual, and certainly not the private investor who views every hospital bed as if a rental property. We have a society that still fundamentally trusts our institutions. The idea of a politician running against Washington is again treasonous. Washington isn't some ogre of a of a place like in like in you know a Tolkien novel or something. It's where the Congress is. It's where the Library of Congress is, the most incredible repository of knowledge on earth. Uh, Washington is the shining marble city of the American dream. To run against it as if it's a swamp or evil is to run, it, it's, it's a psychotic act of, 
it's a truly psychotic act because you're 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 declaring war on oneself. We would never do that in Canada. None of us particularly like to pay the taxes, but we do because we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And in Canada, we recognize fundamentally that the wealth of a society is not the currency secured by the lucky few, but the strength of social relations and the bonds of reciprocity that connect everybody in common purpose. And that's why in that piece in Rolling Stone, I, I use the allegory of getting your gro groceries at Safeway. When you do that in the States, there's a cultural, racial, economic chasm between you and the checkout person that's difficult to bridge. You don't feel that in Canada because it's different. You may not feel as peers. You may not feel that you have more or less education, more or less affluence, but you know that the checkout person is getting a living wage because of the unions. And you know that your kids and theirs probably go to the same school because our schools are neighborhood schools, grocery stores are neighborhood grocery stores, and our schools aren't funded by property taxes that favor the children of the affluent neighborhoods. They are grants from the government that give ideally and theory, in, in effect every kid the same per capita resources to use education to transform their lives. And then third and most important, they know that you know that they know that if their kids get sick, they'll get exactly the same medical care as, as your kids and the prime minister's kids. And that's true. Now, I'll tell you one final um, uh, anecdote about that, Rhett, is that when my mom was 85, she got a headache living alone in an apartment in Victoria, BC. At 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, by two o'clock, she was being prepped for neurosurgery. By the time my sister and I got to her, she was in recovery. And she had been, her life had been saved by an immigrant, an Indo-Canadian surgeon of great genius. Right beside her in the ICU was a young girl from Manitoba, <clears throat> from a Mennonite farming family, surrounded at the bedside by all of her extended and large family. Now, it was really amazing because my sister and I, a prominent lawyer, and I've done well, could have afforded that, that surgery. In the States, that family might have had a choice between the economic well-being of, of the family and the life of that daughter. Now, we in Canada say that's not a choice that any human being in a civilized society, any citizen of a civilized country should have to face or make. And the Empress Hotel, as you know, the fanciest hotel in Victoria had a policy that, that any family member who had a relative in an intensive care unit got a free room for the night. So as we got kicked out of the ICU, the two families came together, poured into our cars, and we all drove back to the Empress, and we all went to the old Bengal bar in the lounge, in that legendary lounge in the hotel there. And all the Mennonites don't drink, so I bought them juice and tea and whatever they wanted. My sister had a glass of wine, I had a beer, and we toasted. But we didn't toast our loved ones who had survived the day. We didn't even toast this amazing unknown doctor who had saved their lives. We toasted our country because it was only our country, and in this case, our healthcare system, that had brought these two families together from two ends of the country geographically, ends of the country in terms of religious belief, ends of the country in terms of socioeconomic um, uh, status. And yet in that moment, we were all as one, uh, in a sense, children of the same nation, grateful to a nation that had made this moment, not just the survival of our loved ones, but this moment, us being there together in that bar, uh, uh, communicating to each other with such grace, devotion, and affection. Uh, and it was our country that made us po that possible. And that, to me, is the essence of patriotism, not flag wrap demagoguery, but the quietness of appreciation that you won the lottery to have been born in a country like Canada. What would you say to a young person who's concerned about the fate of the planet and the state of things right now? I think the most important thing I would say to a young person is it's not your responsibility. It's not your fault. It may be your obligation, but it's not your, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you know how many commencement speeches begin with, you know, the world's a mess. It's up to you, the new generation, to fix it. I mean, what, what kind of BS is that? They didn't make, they didn't you're the one who made the world a mess. You get out and fix it, the old people, you know. I, I think one of the things I've learned, which um, really has helped me a lot, is my father, 
wasn't a religious man, but he he had a profound sense of right and wrong. And he used to say to me, you know, you know, there's evil and there's good in the world. Take your pick and get on with it. And that may sound almost biblical, but you know, it's interesting. We in the West have this idea that um, if we just work hard enough, good is going to vanquish evil. We have that in the image of the, the, the son of God, Christ, and the fallen archangel devil that are always in battle with each other. But the hope is that eventually one day, whether it's a rapture or whatever the people say, you know, the devil's going to be beaten. Well, you know, that's not going to happen. If there's one thing we know in the history of the world is that evil is tenacious. And the, in Eastern religions, they don't have that sense of things. So, for example, you know, it, it, the question that is so obvious, if God is all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the universe? Uh, when you ask that question in the European tradition, you were burned at the stake as a heretic. Uh, but when Lord Krishna was asked that very question, why, if God's all powerful, does he allow evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. In other words, you know, there's always evil and good. And you're not going to beat evil and you're not going to win and, and, and the purpose in life isn't really to win. You know, when, when um, there, there, there are two, two things that cause bitterness in old age, and the one goal in life should be to reach your older years um, without bitterness. And bitterness tends to happen to those who look back on a life of decisions imposed upon them by the outside when they've succumbed to that kind of social pressure. And contentment comes to those who have been the architect of their own lives, and they look back on decisions made by them, perhaps not always correct or the best, but at least they own them, and so they are responsible for who they are. That's that's the key to contentment and peace of mind in, in old age. Uh, so on that front, I say to young people, you know, be patient. Uh, it takes time to form something as unique uh, as, an, uh, as an original life. You know, give your destiny uh, time to find you. Don't compromise. Um, and at the same time, I say, don't think that you're, the other bitterness comes, bitterness also comes with people who expect to win, expect to change the world. Uh, one of my favorite writers, um, Peter Mathewson, uh, and I read this at a time when I did think I could change the world. That was my entire purpose in life, if you will, in my youth. Peter wrote that anyone who thinks they can change the world is both wrong and dangerous. And he had in mind people like Hitler, Mao, and Stalin. Uh, uh, but, but what he was also saying is in a Buddhist sense, you know, it's not a destination. It's not about winning every battle. It's about the process. You know, the pilgrim embarks on a journey, but the goal is not a physical place. It's a state of mind. And by the same token, as you, as you work your way through life, Yes, it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not a reason not to fight battles. And you may win a battle, an environmental battle for something, and you may lose a battle. But don't identify yourself with that outcome and don't allow yourself to succumb to despair when you are defeated. Because if you realize that, you know, it, it's not about an end game, it's about a path of life. And that's what my father meant when he said, pick your, your side and get on with it. You're never going to roll evil off the cliff, but you can roll righteousness up the mountain. And you'll never stop pushing it because it always needs to be pushed because it's an eternal battle between good and evil. And that may sound almost ap apocalyptic uh, or, or even um, uh, evangelical in its, in its essence, but I think it's really true. And, and um, because of that, at least in my life, I've found that even though I'm 66, I have the exact same energy for new causes, the same energy for new passions, the same excitement when I embrace a new book project. And it, it's because I don't expect any of my books to change the world. I just expect them to be my contribution to that world. And in that sense, I think it, 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 it allows one uh, to, to really have peace of mind. And I, and I think it's kind of, I, th I think it's kind of true. I think, I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, the, the Buddhist Dharma is not about the twiddling of thumbs, you know, the Buddhists are onto something. Thank you so much. I mean, this was absolutely fascinating. I mean, I'm sure we, I would love to hear you talk. I'd love to talk for another hour, obviously, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for taking the time. And if you'd ever like to do this again, I've got um, plenty of other questions. Um, but again, I know I know well, we're uh, past our time limit. Well, no worries. But I hope people get out and get a chance to look at the book Magdalena River of Dreams. It's it's a it's a beautiful book. All right. Well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mind the bay.